Konnichiwa. Um, well, my name is Chuki Chen, and I thought about giving the talk in Japanese, but then I saw in the schedule that uh, Testo Kakekake Ojisang is here in the <laughs> other room. Uh, so I think I will stick with English. But if I'm speaking too fast, please let me know because I do want you to understand, okay? Don't be shy, raise your hand, okay? All right. And the uh, slide is already available online. Um, if you would like, you can follow along with that link because um, I want to make sure that you can read it. Some of the slides, I actually use the full screen even though I was told that I, don't, I shouldn't use the bottom part. Uh, so if you would like, I also posted the link on Twitter so you can also follow along like that. All right, let's get started. Who here does Android testing? Okay, half of the room. Uh, Expresso, who does Expresso testing? Okay, a little bit less. Um, so I will cover the basics for those who have not done it before. What is Expresso then? The way I look at Expresso is that you can do automated UI testing without hands, you don't have to touch your phone. It's a little bit of a lie because you need to use your hands to write the test. But once you wrote the test, then you can use the Expresso framework to provide click events or typing or things like that, and it will be run automatically without you pressing buttons. So that's a great way to keep running the test and make sure that you do not break, you do not break things that used to work. And another interesting thing about Expresso is that it's uh, written by Google and it's provided by the Android testing support library. Um, like I mentioned before, you use it to simulate user actions. And Expresso also claims to do automatic synchronization. And it's a little bit confusing when you first look at it, because what does that mean? Um, what it means is that when you are running your test, it will know that your UI is busy and it will wait for the UI to be done before it goes ahead to verify or to run actions. So how many of you have done UI testing before Expresso? using other frameworks. Okay, maybe nobody. Um, so I've done that before, and the painful part is that because it doesn't know how to wait, sometimes the testing code will try to click on a button that has not yet been rendered on screen, so it fails because it cannot find the button. And the classic way of solving that problem is to put in sleep statements, and that is not very predictable. So Expresso takes care of that for you, which is very nice. Next, we are going to go through a Hello World example. Expresso follows a formula, on view, perform, and check. On view takes a view matcher, so you use that to look for the particular view that you want to act on. Once you found the view, you can call some view actions using the perform function, and then you can also check and make sure that it is how you think it should be. We'll go through an example called Hello World, and the way this works is that the greet button, when you click on it, will become disabled, so you can only greet once. To specify the view matcher, there are a lot of built-in ones. In the example, I'm going to use with ID, meaning that I want to look for the view that has the ID greet button. After I found the view, I can go ahead and perform click, so I will click on the button. And if you look at the app, it will actually, you will actually see the button being pressed. And after that, I want to check that the button is no longer enabled. You can see on the screenshot that it's a little bit less visible. It's a little, it's a little bit grayed out. The interesting part here is that I am checking that it's not enabled, but instead of calling a function that is, is not enabled, I'm calling a function that is enabled, but then wrapping it with not so that I negate it. That way, you can combine different matches and have much more powerful matching. I have actually a lot of these code are on GitHub, so throughout the talk, you will get uh, links like that. And because the whole slide deck is already online, you can just get that and then you can click on them. So no need to write them all down. Um, so the Hello World example is available. You can go ahead and try it yourself. Like I mentioned before, the with ID function is a part of the Expresso library. And all the other ones that are highlighted here are also provided by the Expresso library. They are Android specific. So there's with ID, click, 
matches and also enabled, right? You want to verify that the button is enabled. Not does not come from the Expresso library. It comes from the Hamcrest library, which is a, li uh, which is a library that is Java, so it's not Android specific. There are multiple different things that you can use to combine all these matches. Uh, Expresso has all these different functions and we are not going to cover every single one of them today because otherwise you'll be here until tomorrow and I don't want to do that. But there is a cheat sheet and okay, like I was warned, you will not be able to see the link, so please get the slide deck afterwards and then you can click on it. Um, there is the cheat sheet that is available on the code.google.com website and then you can go ahead and see what other functions you can use. Hamcrest also has many different functions. Uh, you can see that you can have the not, which is the third line here, um, but you can also use another one that I use a lot is all of. So you can put multiple matches and then all of them has to match. Again, you can get the PDF from this link. Well, now let's try to combine some matches. Here I have an example, which is the toolbar. If you think about it, when you write an app, you provide your XML file, right, which has all the different IDs. But when you change the toolbar title, that is not a part of the XML that you give. So how are we going to match that? One very useful technique is to use Hierarchy Viewer. How many of you know Hierarchy Viewer? Okay, very good. Um, so for those of you who don't know, it allows you to look at your app and see how all the different views are constructed in a tree, essentially. That's what hierarchy means. Um, in this particular example, I was looking for my awesome title. That's what my toolbar was showing. And I see that it is in this text view. The bad news is that this text view doesn't have an ID associated with it. So I cannot use the with ID matcher. So how are we going to find this? Um, we noticed that the text view is a child of the toolbar, so we can use that to find this text view and then to verify it. Uh, so here, I am going to write my own function that will look for the toolbar. So the test on top is the test method. I will call the match toolbar title method, which is the second one, and this is the uh, matcher that I was telling you about, the Hamcrest matcher, that is all of. So we want two conditions. One is that the view that I am looking for is a text view, which is what the is assignable from means. The second condition is that I want it to be a child of toolbar. So the way I do that is that I want, I'm saying that the view I'm looking for with parent and then is assignable from toolbar class. Once I have located this view, then I can go ahead and check that it has the text of the title that I'm interested in. So you may wonder, well, I saw that it's a text view. Why don't I just use a single condition, just use the assignable text view and forget about the second part where the parent is a toolbar? Well, you, very likely that your app will have multiple text view. And when Expresso find multiple um, views that matches your condition, it will fail and just tell you, or oh, there are multiple matches. If for well, those of you who have done Expresso before, you might have seen this. It will do star, 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 matches, star, 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 if there are multiple of them, um, which is why I need a second condition to pinpoint that one single view. And then that was one way that I can find the toolbar. Let me also show you a second way. The reason why we want to do that is because when we were using the hierarchy viewer, we are looking into the inner structure of the toolbar. That's a little bit fragile because the toolbar comes from the support library and Google may decide that, oh, I don't want it to be just a direct child of the toolbar. I want to add some extra layers of layout and then your test will break. So what we are going to do using the custom matcher is that we are going to use the function from the toolbar class called .getTitle. That is a part of the public API, so that is much less likely to change rather than the the inner structure, which is not published, right? Because we just kind of looked into it with Hierarchy Viewer. Now, this is similar to what we did earlier, right? We, we did the on view and then the check. However, the on view now, we are looking into the toolbar class directly, not the text view. And after we found the toolbar, 
we want it to match the with toolbar title function, which we are going to write ourselves. This is how you write a custom matcher. It's a little bit dense, the code, uh, but the important part here is to pay attention to the new bound matcher method. So we are overriding the bound matcher, meaning that I want to make sure that the type matches. And the type was given in the little um, angle bracket that says toolbar. So I want to be matching a toolbar. And once I am matched with a toolbar, I also want to make sure that the title matches. That is done in the matches safely function. It says test matcher dot matches and then toolbar dot get title. Test matcher is something that you pass in from the let me just show you the previous slide. From, from the previous slide when you see is title, so that is is the text matcher that is provided by Hamcrest. Um, the reason why I do it this way is because, oh, sorry about that. It's because I want to be able to replace the it is function with other things. For example, I can do um, starts with, end with, or contain. So I can partially match the title. Um, the, the next part, the describe tool, is for debugging. So when something goes wrong, there's a way to say that, well, I'm looking for the toolbar title, this particular title, but then something else was matched. So far so good? Okay, just want to make sure people are not sleeping. <laughs> good, you are laughing. Very good. Again, more information, you can go ahead and look at the GitHub sample. I also have a blog post that explains pretty much what I just said, but in case you want to review that, you can also read the blog post. Next, we are going to cover on data. What does this do? So we have seen the Expresso formula before, on view, perform, check. On data is similar, except that it is used for adapter view. So the most common adapter view is a list view. And you have to think about it slightly differently. Instead of matching a view, you are matching a data, which is why it says on data. And you are using an object matcher rather than a view matcher. Um, and then there's an extra thing called data options. Data options allow you to look into the list view. Well, I mostly use it for list view. Um, a little bit more specifically. So here, for example, if you call in adapter view, sorry, in adapter view, you will use that when you have multiple list views in your app and you want to match a particular one. So sometimes that happens when you, for example, have a navigation drawer and also have a list view. Um, you can also specify the position or you can specify on child view, meaning that once you found the particular item, it may have multiple things, right? It may have an image and then some text. So you may want to specify that, well, inside this list item, I want to specifically look into this child. Let's go through an example. Well, I have a list view here. It shows you the items uh, with a number on it. And I want to look for item, say, 27. So just as a quick overview of what the app does, um, the list view takes in a array of items. And each item knows essentially its position. Um, you can see the construction new item i. So it, just remembers which number it should be showing. And then I make an adapter, and then I set it. The item here, it stores the value, and it also displays it using the toString function. And when I click on a particular item, uh, if you can see at the bottom, it says 8. So that's after I click on the item 8, it will show in the footer that 8 has been clicked. So we're going to verify that in our test as well. So in this test method, we're going to check multiple things. The first thing we're going to check is that that footer, which has the ID text, is not displayed initially. And then I'm going to click on the list item that has the value 27, and I want to make sure that the bottom text is displayed as 27, and also, uh, well, well, actually, so there are two checks because I want to both check that it is displayed and the value is 27. Um, here I want to point out that you see how I have two check lines but then only one semicolon? The way the view matches work, um, you can actually chain them up. So if you are looking at the same view 
either checking or verifying. So both the perform and check, you can just keep going. Um, so that make, makes your code a bit shorter, and also then Expresso don't have to go look for it multiple times. So look at the on data line. So the width, uh, the width value function is actually written by us. It's not provided by Expresso or Hamcrest. And let's see how we do that. Again, our best friend bound matcher is here. Uh, this time we are matching it with a main identity dot item. I was too lazy to make a separate class. So the item class, what we are doing in the match safely function this time is that I want to know whether the value is the same as the one I'm looking for. So if I'm looking for 27, I want to make sure that that particular item is being displayed. Okay, so that's list view. How about recycler view? If you look at this screenshot of recycler view, it looks exactly the same as the list view example, right? But if you want to write Expresso test for it, it's going to be completely different. We cannot use on data. Does anybody know why we cannot use on data? Hmm. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Okay, nobody knows. Oh, well, there goes my sound effect. Uh, so the reason why you cannot use on data is because on data is only usable with adapter view. And recycler view is a view group. It's not an adapter view. Therefore, you cannot use on data which is a bummer because we just learned how to use it. Now we have to learn yet another way of matching things. Let's take a look. Um, so now we have to forget about matching things by data and go back to matching things by view. Um, the way we're going to do that is, again, the, it's the same test method that we wrote earlier. So the first line is verifying that the footer is not displayed. The second line is doing the click. This time we are going to use, again, the on ID uh, sorry, the with ID function. We're going to go ahead and look for the recycler view and perform an action on the 27th item. Um, so here we are including the recycler view actions library so that we can use a action on item at position. So we give it a position, which is 27, and then we say that the action we want is click. Once we do that, we can do the same verification. We can look for the footer and check that it, the, it is displayed and the text is 27. If you don't want to use uh, the action on item at position, there are other things that are provided by that library. You can, oh, sorry about that. This is just the equivalent of that in list view. So if you don't want to use the, use, uh, find that item by position, you can also find it by action on holder item or action on item and then you can match it with a view. Um, so it's a little bit different from when you are doing it with list view. You have to use this helper library. Um, again, more information, you can go ahead and look at the sample code, and then you can change it and try different things. So idling resource. This one, I need to drink some water before talking more because this is going to be difficult. Has anybody used that before? OK. Four people. So I mentioned earlier that Expresso knows when your app is busy and then it will wait. Um, that is the notion of idling. So Expresso built in have two things that it watches. It watches the UI event queue, meaning that if you have events scheduled and trying to render things, it will not run the Expresso functions. The other thing that it does is it watches the async task thread pool if you're using async task for some background tasks. So it will wait for them to finish. But beyond that, it doesn't know how to wait. Um, fortunately, Expresso provides an interface so that you can write your own conditions to wait for things that are specific to your app. Um, so for example, say you have an, a service and you want to wait until that it is done before going to verify your test. Um, we are going to walk through that example together. Uh, when you have an item resource, there are three functions that you need to override. The first one is get name. Uh, you can give it any name you want. The important part is that if you have multiple idling resource, make sure that you give them different names because it is used as the key in the hash map to track all these things. So if you have clashing names, then it's going to get confusing. Um, the second function is register 
idle transition callback, you pretty much always do it, the, th the code that I just showed you. You are given a callback and you're going to store it away in a method, um, in a variable, so that in the it's idle now function, we are going to call that. Um, so it's idle now is the main part of your idling resource. It's the logic that is going to tell Expresso whether your app is idling. Um, so in our case, we are going to have a helper function that tells us whether the service is running. If it's, ru if it's not running, then it's idle. So that's why I have boolean idle equals not running. And then if it is idle and I have a callback, I will go ahead and call the callback to on transition to idle. Um, and then after that, I will return the idle boolean so the expressor will know whether it should wait some more or it can go ahead and do all the different actions. So it's intent service running is the helper functions that we're going to write. Um, the way I do it is that I want to get the activity manager and I'm going to go and find the service by name. Um, so that's why I have the Request, like the, the service I'm looking for here is repeat service, so it's repeat service dot class dot get name, and if the name is the same, then I return true, meaning the function uh, the service is running. If I go through all of them and I don't find it, then I return false. Um, so in your app, it will probably be something different that you're waiting for. So you need to think of how do I determine whether the app is idle or not. Once you have defined your idle resource, you need to register it. Uh, so there are register and unregister. You can see here, expresso.register idling resource and then the unregister. Most of the time, you can use it as a before and after. Um, so here I have the annotation at before and at after. Those are JUnit4 annotations, meaning that these methods will be run before your test method and then after your test method. So you register your idling resource, run your test, and then it will unregister. Um, there may be situations that you want to do it in the other places, but most of the time this will work. Uh, so uh, yes, idling resource is complicated, so there are multiple blog posts that I wrote, so if you are interested, there are more examples that you can learn from. And again, all the source code is going to be on GitHub. Um, I'm also going to talk about Dagger and Mojito, even though they are not strictly Expresso, because together it's very powerful. Um, but have you done any dependency injection? A little bit, okay. And using Mokito? Okay, good. Well, actually more people use Mokito than Dagger. That's interesting. So what is it? Um, dependency injection essentially is a way for you to put all the dependency for your app in a central place um, so that you can replace that with different components depending on your situation. So in our case, we want to have different component when the test is running. And Mokito is a way to mock objects. And it's a convenient way for me to be able to change the behavior of some objects. Instead of writing the whole object, I can just use the Mokito API to specify how it should behave. We will see the example in the slides later. So for Dagger, the way you are going to specify is that I'm going to have a demo component, which is going to inject into the main activity. And this is an interface that I am going to subclass. The application component right now is empty and you may be like, why is it empty? Why do I even bother writing that? Well, the important part is the annotation. If you can see on top, it says singleton component and then the module is the clock module. Um, Dagger uses the annotation processor to automatically generate the dependency injection code for you. And what you need to do is to use the annotation to specify what it should generate. Um, so in this particular case, even though the body is empty, because it extends demo component, the application component is able to inject into the main activity. And then we also need to specify the test component, which in addition to injecting into the main activity, we also need to inject into the main activity test. And in this particular case, we are going to be using the mock clock module. And there's a, um, I made a little diagram so that you can see it easier. Um, so the application component will have a clock module and the test component will have the mock clock module. And with that, what we are going to do is 
in the application, we are going to create the component. That's the first line. Um, then that create component function is going to be returning the dagger demo application underscore application component dot builder. Whew, that was long. Um, the reason why it was that long is because it's automatically generated by dagger. And Dagger wants to make sure that it doesn't clash with any other thing in your app, so it went with a long name, um, which is why also it has the prefix Dagger. Um, so it automatically creates that component, and I'm going to store that in the component variable and then return it with the component function. In the mock application, what I'm going to do is I'm going to subclass demo application, and then I'm going to override the create component, and instead of the application component, here I'm creating a test component which will provide a mock clock module. So now I have two different applications. How is it going to be supplied to my app? This is the way. Um, I am going to define a custom test runner. The custom test runner, what it does is that when it needs to create a new application, Instead of, normally, it will just use the application that's specified by your manifest, which is um, application. And here, what I am going to use is the mock demo application. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm overriding the new application function, calling the superclass, but instead of the normal name, which is passed in, in the string class name, I'm going to hard code the mock, applica mock demo application class name. That way, Every time the application is loaded by this test runner, my mock application is going to be called, and therefore the mock clock module is going to be provided. Does that make sense? It's a little bit not clear. Okay, I assume it's good. All right, so now that we have defined the mock test runner, we still need to tell the uh, Expresso framework to load it. Um, the way you do that is to put it in your uh, build.gradle file. You usually already have a line there that uses the Android J unit test runner, um, so you would want to replace that with your custom test runner. After all that work, we can finally actually write some tests. Um, in the app, we are going to be using this function called getNow in the clock class. And normally what it does is it will create a new daytime object, which is a Jota time function that will tell you the current time and current date. And the problem with that is that if you're doing that in your test, then every time you run your test, the time is going to change and you cannot verify the behavior. So therefore, in our test, we are going to use Mokito. And this is how you specify things in Mokito. Basically what you're saying is that, well, when somebody calls the getNow function on my clock object, I'm going to return this one. Um, this is a, also a daytime object, but I specified the exact moment in time. So it's the year 2008 in September on the 23rd at midnight. Um, so that, that way, every time we run the test, I know the time because I have specified it myself. Uh, which this day, by the way, is the date that Android launched. So, yay. Um, after I have provided this, then I know when I run my test that I can go ahead and check the test in the text view with the ID date that it will always display 2008-09-23 rather than today's day, which is 2016 something something. Um, so this is why I would like to run my test with Dagger and, and Mokito so that I can control the component that is going to be specified in my test. I have written a blog post and there are also multiple things that you can do to learn more. There is the uh, GitHub repository. Um, I also actually recorded a video course which is the last link. Um, so if you want to listen to me more, you can go ahead and get that. Wow. So. I have covered a lot here, just a quick summary of everything that we have gone through today. We have learned about the basic formula of Expresso, which has view matcher, view action, and view assertion. And then we learned with the two by example how to combine them and also write our own custom ones. Then we looked at list view and recycler view, which has two very different ways of writing tests. Um, and then 
The idling resource session tells you how to tell Expresso to wait for your app to finish before it verifies uh, conditions. And finally, I also have an example with Mokito and Dagger. But wait, there's more! Um, I have also open sourced a library called Friendspell. Uh, it is an app that uses the Google login API and then also the nearby API. So what it does is that if you have this app and your friend also has this app, both of you can log in with Google Plus and then you put the phones next to each other and then they are going to share some information um, and then it will be stored in a database. Um, so how do I test that? Right? Like, I, am I going to have two phones next to each other all the time and then run the test? Um, so I have used some even more advanced techniques in this repository, which um, I use Dagger and Mokito so that I can mock data. Um, it has multiple levels of testing. It has JUnit testing, which is without the UI. You can run it on the JVM, meaning running on your computer rather than on emulator or device. So that's much faster. Um, I use that to verify my Pojo, my um, Java objects. Um, I also have what I call UI-less instrumentation. Instrumentation just means that you have to run it on a device. Um, so I want to verify the database code, which there's no UI. I don't need to look at anything. But I cannot run it on the JVM because it depends on the, uh, the Android libraries. Uh, so I have that as an example, and then also Expresso, of course. And uh, somebody on the internet thinks that this is a very good library, so I just want to put the quote here to convince you to check it out. So he said, seriously bad as testing Kung Fu on display here. Uh, um, so I'm very happy that somebody likes this, and I hope that um, other people can also learn from it. Um, the reason why I did it is because I feel like there's a lot of toy examples for testing or teaching other things. And sometimes when there are more complexity, like a real app is not just, oh, I have this one thing I do. So I want to have an example that has a lot of complexity and also have tests because there is not a lot of tests out there. Um, so thank you very much. So these are a lot of links that you can go follow up. Um, the first link is this slide deck. Uh, so like I said, I already put it on my Twitter. Um, is ADV, that stands for advanced, and then ESP for Expresso. So bit.ly link, and then ADV ESP. Um, and then I have the GitHub examples up here as well. Um, after that, those are just different things that you can uh, find me on the internet. I teach a video course on Pluralsight, uh, which is the fifth link, yes. Um, and then also Gumroad is another place that I put some of my courses. I also wrote another one that um, if you want to do dependency injection, but you're don't want to use Dagger for some reason. Um, I have written a very small ebook that you can read. And if you use the coupon code JOYKAIGI, you can get a discount. You have to buy it. So, but you can use the discount code JOYKAIGI if you're interested. And then the rest of it are just places that you can find me on the internet, my newsletter, Twitter, blog, and Google+. So I actually have a lot of time for questions. Yeah. So please do ask questions. And Nihongo demo, Ilio.